How you doing? Good to be with you. Hey, as Matt mentioned, we're going to look at marriage today. And just a couple of disclaimers off the top when it comes to marriage. I am married, okay? And so I can speak with just a tad bit of street cred on this, on both sides, um, what God's taught us, how things have been challenging, and how God has renewed what is challenging and continues to do so. Uh, Number two, uh, talking about marriage in a single message and not couched in a longer series is about as ambitious as trying to teach us how to run a marathon in a day, okay? There are just some things I'm not going to say that you're going to want me to say. Or I'm not going to get to that you want me to get to, but by the time we get into next year, we'll probably do a series on marriage and intimacy. Look forward to that. Number three, and finally, I understand that marriage is an extremely sensitive topic. And so I want to do my best today to address it compassionately and honestly and directly and yet couched in encouragement because I believe God has a dream for our marriages. And I hope by the time we're done, you see that dream no matter where you're coming from today. If you were to go home today and do an interesting experiment, get on Amazon and in the search bar, type in marriage bar into the search, you'll, you'll find that there are 150 thousand books on marriage. Furthermore, there are 40,000 books on dating, 30,000 books on attraction, and get this, almost 200,000 books on sex, which taken together must mean we're pretty terrible at connecting with one another. I mean, why else do you need 190,000 books, not chapters, but books on sex? Why do you need 150,000 books to teach you how to go about marriage unless we just don't really know how to do it. And we need a lot of help in the process. So where in the world do we begin when we've lost sight of what God has designed to be good and given to us as a gift of His grace? Before we go there, I want to acknowledge that I think today we're all over the map when it comes to marriage, right? Some of us in the room are single and we praise God for that and what he's doing in your life in this season. Some of you want, are single and want to be married, okay? And uh, I think we've got a lot to offer you today when it comes to how we connect together and what God's dream for marriage is, okay? I think some of us in here are married and we're flourishing. Like some of you have been married for a week, okay? And it's just pure joy, all right? It's just you're living in the better days. And there are more better days, be encouraged. I'm not downing marriage, but you're in those initial just better, when it comes to better or worse, you're just in the better day, just better, it's just good, it's bliss. And then some of us are flourishing, and we've been married 10, 20, 30 years, and you were in the better, and then you walked through the worse, and then the better, and the worse, and the ups, and the downs, and the mountains, and the valleys, and the dark times, and the bright times. And how many of you who have walked through those times would say, my marriage is better because of the challenges we've faced? My marriage is better because of the challenges we've faced. I think God does some of his greatest work in the challenge, in the valley. So some of us are flourishing, and God has used those times to draw us together. Um, We love one another more. We're more committed to one another. We're more excited about God's dream for our marriage than ever before. And then there are some of us in the room today who are floundering. You know, we got married. We ran into it. We had great hopes for marriage, and we're getting in, and the further we get, we're asking, is this all that there is? And we're disappointed, if we're being honest. But we don't share our disappointment with anyone else because we don't want people to know we're disappointed because we think everyone else is happy in their marriages. And we don't know who to reach out to for help. Some of us in the room have experienced heartbreaking events or even serious betrayal in our marriage that has shaken it to the core. Some of us came in and we're at a tipping point in our marriage and we're not sure whether or not we're going to keep going or whether we should keep going. And I'd say regardless of where you are today, I want to lay hope before you because I believe God has a dream for your marriage. And if you will trust him and follow him into unfamiliar places, I believe he can do great things through your lives as he leads you forward. Our family earlier this month was in South Dakota at a ranch, and the bedroom where Beth and I were staying had a picture of an older couple on the wall, and underneath was a caption that I love. Never forget, it said, the first 50 years of marriage are always the hardest. You love that? 
And that really well sums up, pretty well sums up, sums up our, the first part of our marriage. I mean, it does. I walked into our marriage with Beth extremely selfish and stubborn and did not do a very good job of helping her flourish as a young woman or mother. And as a result, there were some very difficult days. And there are still very difficult days at times, but because Beth is stubborn and I'm not, all right? So joking. She was over here in the first service and, um, and uh, she just walks right along with that because she knows I'm an extremely stubborn man. And God continues to do a new work in my life. And here's the beautiful thing we've experienced in over 18 years is God has taken us through the fire, through the valley, through the dark times, and he's breathed new life and hope and joy into our marriage. And as he's done that, we've been able to walk alongside countless couples who God has worked in their lives to miraculously reconcile or restore or renew their love for one another as they've taken hold of his dream for their marriage. And so today, I just want to lay hope before you, and I want to encourage you. As a man who is still in process, as a husband and a wife, Beth and I, who are still in process, as God continues to work out his dream in our lives. So go with me, Genesis chapter 2, which is really the first place that we begin to see a hint of a relationship and then ultimately becomes marriage. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, I just want to break down these first couple of verses before we get in. He says, the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. Verse 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone, to which men say, hallelujah, okay, I will make a helper who is just right for him. Now, I want to stop there because there's a lot of church baggage around this verse. This word helper is the same Hebrew word that's applied to God frequently through the Old Testament, and this is not God saying, I will make Adam a servant, That's not what is going on here. This is not God saying, you know what, I've given Adam a big task, and I need someone to make a sandwich for him. I need someone to do his laundry. That's not what's happening here. And some of us are struggling in our marriage because we misunderstood the purpose of marriage and the purpose of man and woman within marriage. And I hope God renews that for you today. This word helper is a significant word because over and over throughout Scripture, it's applied to God as one who comes alongside to bolster and strengthen and pick up. Don't you love that? So, man, God saw you, you were alone, and he's like, oh, man, that cat's going to be weak. I need to bring someone alongside who will be strength for him in difficult times, who will be help for him in hard days, who will come alongside to provide companionship and partnership. He can't do it on his own. She can't do it on her own. They're going to walk through this together hand in hand, heart in heart. It's, it kind of gets at companionship, partnership, not some servient roles that are woven through the text that does not exist there. So it's important you see that as we go on to discover what each man and woman do within marriage. Here we go. So the Lord God, verse 19, formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought to them the man, uh, the animals to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock and all the birds of the sky and the wild animals, but still, still there was no helper just right for him. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last the man exclaimed, Wow, this one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh she will be called woman because she was taken from man. And this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now, if you look at the text before these verses, up until this point in the narrative, everything that was created is called either good or very good by God. Everything has a partnership to it, something that completes it. So the seeds have the fish and the teeming creatures within it. The skies have the birds and the clouds, the stars and the moon, everything in it that completes it night and day. The land has vegetations and animals and mankind, but God sees Adam and says for the first time, he is alone, this is not good. And so there's this kind of humorous point in the text where God says, Let's start with the animals. And so the animals start coming before Adam, and he's going to name them, and he's looking at them. And you've got to imagine he's like, not like me, okay? 
not like me. Not like me, not like me. And, oh, that's very impressive. You know, there's a lot of impressive animals. But each one he's saying, not like me. And then God causes him to go to sleep. And when he wakes up, he sees a woman. And for the first time, he says, oh, like me, right? Like me. This is amazing. We begin to see hints in the text of how God's created us for companionship, for partnership, for relationship, for community. And I'm not even speaking uh, of sexual intimacy or of marriage yet. I'm just talking about we were created to have deep personal connection with one another. And then, of course, as you get further into the text, you begin to see that one of the greatest pictures for the deep, intimate connection we were created for is found in marriage. Unfortunately, today, before we get into the text, I just want to explain culturally where we've come and that I think we've lost sight of what God created marriage to be. Many of us, having been conditioned by a consumeristic culture for a majority of our lives, tend to view marriage through the lenses of consumerism. And what I mean by that is most of us look at marriage or go into marriage saying, what's in it for me? I want you to say that with me. What's in it for me? I want you to say it like you meant it. What's in it for me? That's how most of us tend to view marriage. It's not about partnering for something. It's not about coming together to make something beautiful. It's not about honoring Jesus' dream for our lives. It's just about finding romantic fulfillment and happiness. I want you to think about the breakdown that already occurs when we go into marriage saying, what's in it for me? If the husband goes in saying, I'm going to be happy and satisfied no matter what, and the wife goes in saying, I'm going to be happy and satisfied no matter what, when he says, you adjust to me, and she says, no, you adjust to me, and he says, you fill me, and she says, no, you adjust to me, and you complete me, and he says, you fix me, and she says, I could never do that. You're broken beyond imagination, okay, bro? I could never do that. You begin to see the breakdown of marriage because what God created for our good and for us to adjust to one another and serve one another and live for the joy of one another, we turn into a consumer model and we say, what can I get from this relationship? And things start to break down. You say, why do they begin to break down? Because this isn't what he designed marriage to be. He has a far more beautiful and wonderful plan. And his plan revolves not around a contract or a consumeristic model, but around a word that's found in Scripture over and over, and it's called a covenant. The best picture I know um, about a covenant comes in every wedding that I have a chance to do. I've got opportunity to do those often in my role. And one of my favorite times in a wedding is when a groom and bride stand on the altar and they turn toward one another and they begin to make promises to each other in front of God and people. And have you ever noticed in those moments when they say their vows that their vows are remarkably other-centered? They're not rooted in self. They say, I, I promise and I pledge my life to you, to love and hold you for better or worse, richer or poorer, in sickness or in health, till death do us part. I'm not going anywhere. I'm in this forever. I want you to imagine how mortified you would be if you went to a wedding and the vows were consumeristic or contractual. And the bride turned toward the groom and said, I'm in, but you will need to make at least $60,000 a year. And then she turned to him, and, or he turned to her and said, I'm in, but you're going to have to stay fit, young, and beautiful. And then he countered with, I'm in, but. And she said, well, I'm in, but. Well, I'm in, but. And before long, you'd be mortified, and I'd tell you what you do, because it's what I do. I'd get up out of that room, and I would go to the gift table and take my towels back, because I need to replace my 18-year-old towels in my home and actually use them, because that bride and groom will not be using those towels for very long. Because a marriage cannot survive on a contract. It can't survive on a consumeristic approach. What's in it for me? It's not what God created marriage to be. 
In fact, if you think back to married couples, the day that you said I do to your spouse, do you realize that on that day you actually said out loud, this could be good or it could be bad? We could be rich or we could be poor. You could be healthy or you could be sick, but no matter what comes, for better or for worse, I'm not going anywhere. Can you imagine that you actually said that? Some of you are like, wait, I said that, right? That's what you said. You said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm in this for the duration until death does part us. And I love how uh, author Tim Keller and his wife Kathy break this down in their book, The Meaning of Marriage. It's one of the greatest works I've read on marriage and God's design for it, the meaning of marriage. Look into this a little bit further. I don't have far to go, time to go into it too far, but in it they define marriage. And then they go on to express how we have the most vibrant of marriages. Here's what they begin by saying. Marriage is a lifelong monogamous relationship between a man and a woman. And then listen, this is beautiful. And God devised marriage to reflect the saving love for us in Christ. And here's what they're saying. God's view of marriage is that we partner together like Jesus has partnered with us and rescued us from sin and death. God's dream for marriage is that we serve one another in the same way that Jesus has served us, laying aside everything that was dear to him to call us dear to him, sons and daughters. God's dream for marriage is that we adjust to one another just like God has adjusted to us when he called us into relationship. And we adjust to one another for the flourishing of our home, for the flourishing of our children, for the the beauty of our neighborhoods, for the flourishing of our city as we reflect the selfless, saving love of Jesus together as husbands and wives. Now, I want to put a little asterisk, a little side comment on this. Some of us in the room, certainly across this weekend, because statistics say that one in three women will experience some form of of abuse in their lifetime. One in three women. And so some of us in the room today are in a relationship, possibly, that is abusive or violent or emotionally manipulative. And I want you to hear what I'm saying when I talk about covenant and not going in. I'm not at all giving permission to your very broken husband to continue to injure you or hurt you or wound you. In fact, ladies, hear me on this. Some of you, some of the most, the the healthiest, wisest thing you can do, most loving thing you could do would be to step away from your husband right now and to get some help and to bring someone into your life and you can come to us and we'd be happy to encourage and support or you go to a friend or you go to someone who can encourage and build up and lift up and and protect, and you get some help, okay? Because covenant doesn't mean you stay in a relationship that's breaking you. When I talk about a covenant love or commitment to one another, I'm talking about how many of us, if you've been married, have experienced, and all of us at some point will go through difficult seasons, won't we? We'll go through valleys. And it's in those valleys that your tendency is going to be to pull apart rather than draw together. Your tendency in those moments is going to be to grow cold rather than fanning the flames of your commitment. Your tendency in those moments is going to be to drift apart rather than reaffirming your love and saying, I'm not going anywhere. I'm here for better or for worse. Listen, it's in those moments when the the strength of our covenant is tested that we need to bring that covenant relationship under the strength of King Jesus and allow him to encourage us and empower us to keep going. And some of us today need that encouragement to hold on to Jesus and to keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Because it's oftentimes in the worst moments of marriage that God does his best. We keep going. Tim Keller describes this further when he says in any relationship there will be frightening spells in which your feelings of love dry up and when that happens you must remember that the essence of marriage is that it is a covenant a commitment a promise of future love so so what do you do you do the acts of love despite your lack of feeling he writes appropriately you may not feel 
tender or sympathetic and eager to please. And I would say on any given Monday morning, you're not going to feel tender and sympathetic and eager to please. But he says, but in your actions, you must be tender, understanding, forgiving, and helpful. And if you do that, as time goes on, you will not only get through the dry spells, but they will become less frequent and deep, and you will become more constant in your feelings. This is what can happen if you decide to love. I love that. Because husband, wives, if you choose love consistently, God can do more in and through your marriage than you can imagine. And I believe it's true. Every uh, intimate, joy-filled, life-giving, Jesus-honoring marriage I've seen takes place not because of incredible romance, not because of stellar, kind of mind-blowing honeymoons, not even because of great sex. Life-giving, joy-filled, intimate marriages are built not on the flames of the heat of the moment, but on a lifelong commitment to choose love toward one another day after day after day after day after day. Because that's where God does his works. So you ask the question, well, how do I choose love? What does that actually look like? As we get ready to close, I just want to give you two ways that I believe you can choose love in your marriage again and again and again. In fact, write these down, and then I'm going to give you three questions by which to apply them. But get out your phone. You can write this down in your notes section. Take out your program and the pen. I'm just going to give you two ways to choose love toward your spouse moment by moment, day by day, season by season. Number one, you want to love your spouse well. Pursue Jesus together with her. Amen. Ladies, pursue Jesus together with him. I remember when I was getting ready to propose to Beth, one of my good friends who was well ahead of me in marriage, pulled me to the side and said, I just want to ask you a question. And he asked me what is a million-dollar question that anyone who's stepping into marriage needs to ask. He said, Jed, does Beth love Jesus more than she loves you? And if I'm being honest, I didn't want to answer that question. If I'm truthful, I, at that point in my life, was a pretty consumeristic guy. And I did not want Beth to love anything or anyone more than me. I was a broken man. But I knew in the back of my mind what was true, and that was knowing Beth for the time that I had, she loved Jesus more than she loved me. And 18 years later, Beth pursues Jesus harder and faster than she pursues me. And she is more committed to Jesus even than she is committed to me. And when Beth needs help and direction, especially when it comes to a home project, she goes to Jesus rather than me. You know, some of you guys are like that. For heaven's sakes, just ask God to fix the sink. Do not come to me, okay? And you know what I'm talking about. Beth loves Jesus more than she loves me. And from the time we began marriage and God began to do a new work, in our lives, both of us made a commitment to pursue Jesus together before even we pursued one another. Now, the reality is I just lost some of you there, especially some of you guys. You're like, wait, I'm, I'm supposed to pursue someone before I pursue my wife. I've worked with a lot of guys who have struggled through this question, and they say essentially the same thing. They're like, James Bond doesn't do that, okay? And it works out for James, all right? He just pursues women, and it all works out. Yeah, it worked out for her and her, and her, and her, and her, and her, and her, about two minutes a piece in a two-hour movie, and it's a movie, bro. It's just not going to play out well for you, okay? You want to love your wife in the way she was created to be loved, guys? You want to serve her and watch her flourish in the way she was created to flourish? You want to be in awe of her beauty as Jesus through you as a husband begins to uncover her beauty inside and out. You begin by pursuing Jesus. Here's why. Let me ask you. Does Jesus love Beth more than I love Beth? Answer that question. Does Jesus love Beth more than I love Beth? I'd say so. I have yet to die for Beth's sins, okay? So Jesus loves Beth more than I love Beth, even though I love her a lot. And I know Jesus loves me more than Beth loves me. And so the only way I've found for us to love one another through the thick and the thin, the best and the worst, the poverty and the wealth, whatever that wealth is with five kids, okay, through the dark times and the light times, 
the way that we've discovered to love one another consistently through is to set our hearts and minds again and again on the consistent, selfless, passionate love of Jesus for us. And that's where our hearts are made secure. That's where our hearts are made strong. That's where we find strength in marriage to love one another on difficult days and good days. That's where we find joy in discovering God's plan for our marriage. You pursue Jesus together again and again. And the more you see how much he loves you, the more you're able to practice that love toward one another. He is the ultimate model and perfecter of love. So run after him. And number two, number two, run after one another. Pursue one another. Early on, Beth and I in marriage made one of the best decisions we've ever made. We'll never go back. And that was to set aside one portion of time every week, we call it a date night, to be together. Sometimes it's in the morning, sometimes it's in the evening, midday, whatever that particular week allows us. And for us, when we made this commitment, we, our marriage took a left turn for the better. We began pursuing one another and enjoying one another. And what that meant for us is we had to say no to other things, even good things. So we calendar our day in advance, and I say no to meeting. And we say no on those times to hanging out with friends. And we enlist the help of grandparents if necessary. And we say no to kids' activities. And I say no to running or to golf with my buddies or time out with the guys because Beth is more important to me than anything else. And what we've found in walking alongside couples is that few things breaks down joy and communication and intimacy in marriage than when we pursue things in front of our pursuit of our spouse. So guys, let's talk real honestly. When we spend more time chasing a little white ball around the golf course than we do running after our wife, the relationship is going to break down. Some of you guys in here are hunters, okay? Hunting season's coming around. I'm not a hunter, okay? I don't fully get it, but I think I'm starting to understand it a little bit more. You're going to go out into the woods, paint yourself up, chase something that's living so you can cut off its head and put it above the fireplace and beat your chest, okay? And maybe some of you in the process, you feed your family. All right, but some of you, when it comes to hunting season, your wife has to say goodbye to you, and she doesn't know for how long. And so you run in the woods like you grew up running in the woods. I'm all for hunting, but don't chase the deer faster than you chase your wife, okay? Don't be more passionate about putting a head above your fireplace than you are about loving the woman in your home, okay? Some of us spouses, we, we run after our kids faster than we run after one another. In our kids-centered culture, some of us can't bear the thought of leaving Johnny with a sitter so we can go out and spend time together, or family, some of us are running so fast to chase our kids down, we have no time or energy left for one another. And I'm telling you, if you want your marriage to thrive, it's got to change. Otherwise, you know what's going to happen? You're going to do the same thing some of us are doing today. The only time you see one another and look each other in the eyes is in bed when you say goodnight, and then you go back to Facebook on your device. And some of us are more committed to social media than we are to breaking and saying, who are you, and how are you, and how can I love you, and how can I continue to discover you, and enjoy you, and pursue you, and discover your beauty as God leads us forward. And I believe, husbands and wives, that's where we got to be. you got to pursue each other, and love the pursuit. Listen, guys, if you begin pursuing your wives like that, I have yet to meet a woman who's like, will you stop serving me? Will you stop calling me beautiful? Will you stop going out of your way to love me? Will you stop dying to yourself for my joy? I've yet to meet that woman. And ladies, just chase your husband, okay? There's not a guy in the room who doesn't want his wife to chase him, literally speaking, right? Just chase him. And as you do, you'll discover what God has planned for you. And I just want you to imagine the beautiful things that could emerge in your relationship if you will pursue his dream for you. Some of you are on the mountaintop right now. You're in sweet seasons. Keep running after Jesus and after one another. Some of you need help 
draw near to Jesus, who is eager and willing to come alongside you. Some of you need healing today. Would you bring someone into your life and not go alone and encourage them to encourage you as you walk together in marriage? Some of you need hope. And the beauty of marriage is that it reflects the saving love of Jesus. Listen, we at First Christian believe that hope is for everyone. And I believe God has a plan for you, even if it's hopeless today. So don't go at it alone. We want to walk alongside you, okay? I want to pray for you. And then I'm going to give you three questions and we're going to go out, all right? God, in this moment, I just pray over our community. And I believe today that many of us come in um, excited about and running hard after your marriage, your dream for marriage. I pray that you would motivate us as we run. That we run faster and stronger. And, and more joyfully after one another. Some of us come in hurting and needing help. And I pray that you would be the first to apply your healing mercy to their lives. And then would you surround them with people so they don't go at it alone. God, some of us just need to relearn what it means to chase after one another, to serve, to encourage, to adjust, to build up, to commit to. And I pray today, even across this place, whether there's a husband or a wife on the tipping point, that you would just whisper into their soul, stay there, stay there, stay there. Because I have a dream for your marriage, God, and would you renew what's broken. Lord, we love you, and we thank you that you love us through the best and through the worst until death reunites us with Christ, and we take refuge in that love. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen. All right, I want to give you three questions and then we're going to go out, okay? Write these down. How do we apply this this week together? I want you to reflect on these, husbands and wives, as you go through the week. Number one, do I see my marriage through the lens of consumerism or a covenant? Write that down. Think about this week. Is my marriage, and do I view it through the lens of a consumeristic model, product, something I can get? Or is it a covenant for better or for worse? Ask yourself that. Number two, am I pursuing Jesus first? And listen, if not, today may you begin that, that pursuit. And finally, number three, I love this one. How can I pursue my wife, guys, or my husband? Wait, how can I pursue how can I pursue her? Beth and I have found that in our 18 years, we have to regularly ask this question and reprioritize our commitments. And so here's what I'll leave you with. The world is not going to prioritize your marriage for you. Your employer will not prioritize your marriage for you. Contrary to popular belief, your children will not prioritize your marriage for you. Your responsibilities will not prioritize it. You have to make the hard and courageous decision to say we will prioritize our marriage under the kingship of Jesus and make much of one another for his glory. And that's my prayer that you will do that. And so next week we want to invite you back. On the heels of marriage, we're going to talk about parenting, okay? And we got a lot to share in a short period of time. So we love you and look forward to seeing you next week, okay? Have a great week.